It is my <laughs> immense pleasure to be joined today on Bad Faith Podcast with by Sabrina Salvati, aka Savvy Sabs. You know her from what I think is one of the best streaming programs on the left. Welcome back, Sabby. Hi, Bree. Thanks so much for having me back on. Okay, so you were the first person that popped in my head when I thought about tackling the kind of um, internecine battles on the left news of the week this week, which has been sort of all consuming, at least on the internet. I know the internet isn't real life and mostly these episodes are substantive in nature, but this one I think has a little bit of a mix of, um, you know, uh, salacious online, whatever you want to call it and real substantive news. And of course, what I'm referencing is the back and forth that happened between AOC from one of her IG stories and which was resp- about Jill Stein, which was then subsequently responded to by Jill Stein. AOC impugning Jill Stein using some pretty harsh language. You're just showing up once every four years to do that? You're not serious. You're not, off- to me, it does not read as authentic. It reads as predatory. Jill here. Uh, I'm about to board, but very quickly, I just wanted to thank AOC Pelosi so very much for her very authentic concern about growing green power. Clearly, AOC is the attack dog du jour, and the Democrats are running scared, and they should be, because who wants to support a genocide? Who wants to vote for a genocide? And if there's anything that's predatory here, it's saying that your candidate is working tirelessly for a ceasefire when actually they are actively funding and arming genocide and actually refusing to even consider an arms embargo, which would bring the genocide to a screeching halt. AOC, who's supposed to be in leadership of the Democratic Party, it's amazing if she doesn't know about the anti-democratic tactics and strategies that the Democratic Party uses to crush and silence political opposition. They've been hiring an army of lawyers to throw competitors like me off the ballot. They've been hiring infiltrators and saboteurs and publicly posting uh, job advertisements for those positions. They've been hijacking our public funding in order to keep us off the ballot. And they actually impersonated the Greens to throw us off the ballot uh, in uh, 22 in the Senate race for North Carolina, for example. How is that not fraud and election interference? Also, what's predatory here is stealing the signature issue of the Greens. Our Green New Deal launched in 2010, appropriated by AOC as her signature issue uh, in 2018 without a mention of where it came from. Sabi, I know that you have seen it. I know that you've responded to it. Tell the audience who might not have, we'll obviously insert a clip here, but like, what do you make of this? I think that AOC is doing what the Democrat leadership wants her to do. I think she said those comments about Jill Stein because of what internal polling is revealing, which is that it is very clear that Kamala Harris and Jill Stein are tied for the Muslim vote. And As much as people say that third party is just a spoiler, they never get anywhere. I've never seen this happen before. So what does that say about what the Democratic Party has done for the Muslim community, especially considering the genocide in Gaza? What does that tell you? I think that sends a strong message. So I'm pretty sure she got her marching orders from Democrat leadership to go after Jill Stein. Uh, I think that has backfired because I'm seeing people tell me that they actually weren't going to vote at all, but now they actually want to go out and support Jill Stein just to push back at AOC and the Democratic Party and what they've done to third party uh, trying to get on the ballot in this country. I think that AOC, unfortunately, has become very cocky. I think she has developed quite a bit of an ego. And I think we need to look at what has happened here with the Justice Democrats movement. Cori Bush and Jamal Bowman have been pushed out uh, largely by APAC money. I I would think that AOC would focus on that. Maybe focus on trying to stop APAC from removing your comrades from Congress. Maybe you should focus on that. Uh, So there's that. Uh, But if you notice, APAC did not put up large money against AOC in her reelection. And that's because she was willing to bend the knee in a in a sense. She made the the webinar uh, conflating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, which is part of the reason why DSA decided to unendorse her. That's part of it. 
But AOC has decided to, again, go along with Democrat leadership because she doesn't want to become a Cori Bush or Jamal Bowman. She wants to stay where she is. Uh, but there were a number of lies that AOC said in that criticism of Jill Stein as well. And I've been critical of the Green Party, to be clear. Uh, I've had these conversations before on my show with Green Party candidates running on the local level and with Green Party politicians. And, you know, contrary to what AOC says, there have been Green Party candidates that have won on the local level. In 2022, there were a number of them that won in California. Most people didn't cover it, but they do win on the local level. Now, obviously, there are improvements that do need to be made. Uh, I, I've told this to Green Party members before, the marketing needs to be improved. Uh, there needs to be ads. Uh, you need to improve your website. You need to improve your presence. But all of those things also require money and a lot of funding, which is something that the Green Party just does not have. Uh, but I think that Jason Call has been very uh, willing to listen to criticisms and how to improve. And I think that going forward, you might see something different. There's a lot in there that's really good and I want to um, follow up on. The first, one of the first things you mentioned was that this seems to be a call that was put out um, to respond, to push back against Jill Stein. That seems sort of coordinated. We saw some maybe early evidence of this with the Jamie Harrison uh, DNC chair uh, tweet to Jill Stein. I don't know if you remember that. I think it was maybe a week or two ago, in which she had responded, I think, to a Joe Biden tweet that said Google um, uh, the, the Project 2025. And Jill Stein had said, you know, Google genocide in Gaza. And then Jeremy, uh, Jamie Harrison responded like Putin's puppet. And then there was a whole exchange over that. But then subsequent to that, it does really feel like not just this AOC response, but across at least the internet sphere, there has been a voluminous pushback. That seems like a spike of sorts that, as you alluded to, does seem to be perhaps correlated to this new care study, um, which does seem to suggest that both Kamala Harris and Jill Stein are tied with respect to Muslim voters. And that combined with the most recent polls, which show Kamala Harris behind in every swing state, including Michigan, which, as we know, has the highest proportion of Muslim voters in the United States of America, it does seem to be evidence of a sort of panic coming from the Democrats. That's 100 percent true. Um, I can tell you I've spoken to voters on the ground. I'm going to have another uh, Black voter panel Thursday evening. Uh, but the consensus that I'm hearing from people on the ground is not what you're seeing in the polls. The Kamala hype and the honeymoon period, I think, is over, uh, particularly people in lower income neighborhoods are not drawn to Kamala Harris. This is what has been said to me uh, in person. They don't feel like this is going to be someone that's going to implement significant change to improve their communities. They look at her and they see a female Barack Obama. Oh, we've heard this before. We know where this is going. They don't feel like she has a true connection in particular to the black community. And so there are a number of criticisms there that I think the polls are just not reflecting. And I also want people to understand that polls are really supposed to either inspire you or to uh, deflate you and such. As so, for example, mm -hmm. if you see a number of polls that show that Kamala is surging, well, that's supposed to inspire you. Whether you're on the left or, or the right, that's supposed to inspire you to say, oh, OK, well, I wasn't going to vote, but now I may want to go out and vote. That doesn't mean that's how the majority of American voters feel. We have to remember these voting populations, these polls are significantly small. So always keep that in mind. And it could be possible that Kamala Harris could win the popular vote and lose the Electoral College, similarly to what we saw happen with Hillary Clinton. I remember Hillary Clinton, according to the polls, she was going to beat Donald Trump and it started to get closer and closer as we got to the election day. And then she lost the Electoral College. So I think that I think that the reason why you're starting to see more people shift away, a uh, part of it is the genocide in Gaza, where people said, I'm not going to vote for the Biden administration. And Kamala Harris is a part of that administration. Her interview that she just had made it very clear she's not going to condition uh, weapons or arms to Israel, uh, not even some of it. And that's what Dana Bash was asking her, some of it. 
Uh, so I think that that's part of it. But another part of it is what I've been hearing from voters on the ground for during the Biden administration is that the economy is not working out for them. They're not mm -hmm. making gains within lower income communities, particularly people that fall into that bracket where they're not poor enough to receive SNAP benefits or like Section 8 housing, which also has a wait list, by the way but they're not making enough money that they're able to put aside a savings account and they're able to save up for a home or they can afford to have an unexpected expense. That particular group of the population, we're talking about the working poor, the people who a lot of times are waiting tables or they have two jobs. Those people feel like they have been ignored and left out. And of course, I think a big complaint I've heard from people is that the grocery store prices are still an issue for them. Yeah, I think all of that is really important to note. What seems to be different, because there, there do tend to be um, a lot of usually non-voters who don't vote because they don't feel like there's any material benefit for them. They don't see a lot of difference when there's a R or a D in office. What does seem to be shifting and potentially causing some panic among the Democratic Party is that instead of kind of not registering ideologically as non-voters, there is this percentage now that does seem to either have a spite or because they genuinely are interested in her economic and other kind of social proposals are going to affirmatively vote for Jill Stein. And you alluded to this earlier that there are these people who were tweeting things like, well, I wasn't going to vote anyway, but now I'm definitely going to vote for Jill Stein. And you can interpret that as sort of like spite voting that's not really substantive and, you know, maybe we shouldn't take that seriously. But I do think there's also a little bit of um, kind of I welcome your hatred sort of attitude about it where there's something about the offense from the Democratic Party in this moment that is crystallizing for people who was really actually fighting for them and who was aligned with them that only becomes clear in the face of real opposition. And I do think that that is why, especially with the AOC video, this is a really clarifying moment because you do see this energy and this fight coming from her in that video that I, I would agree we didn't see to that degree in her defense of her own colleagues, the language she used at the DNC, you also mentioned this, uh, defending the Biden-Harris administration, saying that they were working tirelessly to end a genocide. And then she will go off, off screen and have these different kinds of conversations using softer language or or using harsher language for Israel, I should say, using the word genocide the way that she did it on the debate stage. So she did this interview um, with this uh, interviewer named Chi Ose, who framed the lead up question in a way that I wouldn't have. But I do think it gives you a sense of the different kind of tone AOC will take in different contexts when talking about this. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this. Neither party's official platform, in my opinion, right. is good on Palestine. Mm -hmm. I don't think either party right now is doing justice to Palestinians. That doesn't mean that they're the same. Mm -hmm. I think that a Donald Trump presidency would be absolutely catastrophic. I mean, he's coming out here saying right. finish the job right. of a genocide. There's a lot of people with our politics um, that are having a hard time getting there in terms of supporting Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think we help them get there in November to beat Trump? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, first of all, it's important to emphasize how valid it is. We're looking at over 40,000 Palestinians mm -hmm. that have died under Israeli bombardment. And uh, the current U.S. administration has been continued to provide weapons to right. Israel that have been dropping on innocent Gazans. Right. To me, when I process this, mm -hmm. I weigh through all of the people living under extreme levels of, press of oppression, especially outside of places mm -hmm. even like New York. I think about the women that are bleeding out in ER rooms mm -hmm. uh, because they live in red states. I think about trans kids mm -hmm. that are living in places uh, where their entire families are trying to figure out if they need to pack up their mm -hmm. entire lives mm -hmm. and move somewhere else. Mm -hmm. We have to hold all of those things at once. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the conclusion that I've come to is having more people suffer to put on top of the already horrific suffering that's going on in Gaza is not something that I think I'm comfortable right. with. So that particular line of attack, vote, you know, vote blue no matter who, Trump is going to be worse, does seem to be effective among a significant part of the electorate. How would you respond? 
I think that AOC is playing both sides. So she didn't give that response on the DNC stage, right? Because they had already probably approved her speech prior to her going onto the stage. But I think she's playing both sides. Uh, she's saying what she said to that gentleman there, that is to secure uh, the younger voters, to secure the more progressive base and keep them in the Democratic Party. So she's playing their side to let them know, listen, I think both parties are not doing justice for the Palestinian people. But then when she's on the DN stage, the DNC state stage, she's saying that, oh, they're working tirelessly for a ceasefire, which Ilhan Omar, her own comrade, called her out about because that was obviously uh, a lie. It's been unconscionable for me in the last 10 months to witness my colleagues in this administration refusing to recognize the genocidal war that is taking place in Gaza, to not see the mothers who have lost countless children, the babies whose dead bodies are being dug out, do not understand that working tirelessly for a ceasefire is really not a thing and they should be ashamed of themselves for saying such. So she's trying to walk within that lane so that she can still continue to evolve her political career in the Democratic Party, but at the same time, still convince the younger kids that, listen, I'm still a Democratic Socialist and I totally get where you're coming from. I have to tell you that the Trump fear doesn't seem to be working the way that it worked in 2020. I, I do feel like for whatever reason, and part of that could have been because of the pandemic and it was right after Trump's presidency. So people were like, oh my God, we got to get this guy out of here. What I'm hearing from people now is that they had more money under Donald Trump's presidency than they did under Joe Biden's presidency. I am hearing voters say, I can't support a genocide. And I've told them, well, you know, Donald Trump is going to do this as well too. And they said, yeah, but I honestly, I think I have better chances under Trump. I don't get that explanation, and to be honest with you. But I think that what people are seeing is that they're tying the genocide to the Biden-Harris administration because it happened under their rule. And they're the ones that are supplying the weapons. So some people believe that they can probably maybe work some type of negotiation out with the Trump administration now that I guess RFK Jr. is a part of that as well, as well as Tulsi Gabbard, although they're Zionists too. So I don't know why people assume that, but some people assume that there could be some type of negotiation there. I don't. Uh, so I've been trying to get people to understand, like, you have to break away, like you have to support the third parties that are correct on that particular issue. And I think that a lot of voters right now are just not fond of Kamala Harris. We have to remember Kamala Harris ran for president in 2020. So this isn't the first time. Remember, they, they've tweeted her out there. I saw Kamala Harris speak. A lot of people don't know this. I saw her speak in 2020. Uh, she was very much fake. And it's, it was very obvious, but she had a massive crowd to come and see her because this was right after corporate media hyped her up very much so. So I saw her. In, you saw her in, in Boston or at that big rally? And where did she announce California, I presume, in L.A.? This was in New Hampshire. And hmm. there was a line like just wrapped around and around and around uh, to go inside of a church in New Hampshire to see her, to see her speak. And there was a lot of excitement around her then. So I've seen this before. That's why some people may not remember. And then it just seemed like the moment she started to do more interviews, the moment she was on the debate stage, and of course, Tulsi Gabbard kind of delivered her one punch and knocked her out. All mm -hmm. of a sudden, her approval and her poll started to drop. And then she ended up dropping out. Because Remember this. So all of a sudden, it was really weird to me that there was all this excitement around Kamala Harris. And I'm like, don't we all remember that she ran for president in 2020 and she couldn't get a delegate, et cetera. So a lot of it was people just saying, OK, well, at least it's not Joe Biden. She's younger. And I think she's going to be different on the Gaza issue. Uh, but if people would have followed the funding, they would have seen that was never going to be the case because she does take funding from from APAC. So if you ever want to know how politicians are going to stand on certain issues, just look at who their donors are. So that's very important for people to take a look at. And you can see that on Open Secrets. So I think that people had a surge of excitement there. And then, as you saw, that honeymoon period started to, to go away. And then she had the CNN interview 
which was not good for her. And I, I don't care how corporate media says on CNN, these commentators are saying like she did a great job. No, she didn't do a great job. Uh, Dana Bash had to push back a couple of times and ask her a question like more than once, uh, particularly on conditioning arms to Israel. So I think what it showed in that particular space is that Kamala Harris is not strong on her own. Uh, it was really disappointing to me that she had to have Tim Waltz next to her. And the first interview that you're doing after you announce running for president, you should be able to stand on your own. You shouldn't have to sit up there and lean on Tim Waltz, who only had two questions that Dana Bash threw at him. So that there is is very important. That was interesting. I, I frankly, the, the kind of patter about it before the interview happened, I'm not of the view that it is necessarily weak or diminishing or even out of the norm to have your VP with you in a first interview. I do think that Kamala Harris's failure to do any interviews and clear of avoidance of interviews made her really ripe for that kind of criticism, but I don't think it necessarily had to go badly. I did feel though, when I watched it, to your point one, he barely said anything. So why even open yourself up to that criticism if he's not even really gonna say or do anything? And then two, there was something about the setup where she's like a little in the background. He's like closer to the camera because he's on the side of the table. And she also looked kind of small because the table comes up higher on her than it does on him. But I thought was optically actually worse than I thought it was going to be. Like I, did, I didn't, I wasn't actually on the, oh, it's weak of her to have Tim Waltz with her bandwagon. But I did think, I mean, of all the things that happened in that interview, that's like the least important. But I did think it actually didn't look great from her from her octopus perspective. But to the, to, to the bigger point, her answer on Gaza was the kind of one-two punch, the the DNC and the AOC mask off moment, and then the Kamala Harris clear, I will not change from, uh, pivot from Biden's policy with respect to sending weapons to Israel. I will not do an arm, arms embargo. Really, I do think was the death knell for any so-called progressives to continue to pretend as though Kamala represented any sort of a sea change. That being said, it hasn't stopped the mainstream media from manufacturing consent for her and pretending as though the difference between her and Biden is that she is more appealing to and a better sell to younger voters than he was, and that this is what's going to enable her to pull it out in the end. I want to play you um, a clip and get you to respond to this. This is pulled by Case Study QB, always a fave here on Bad Faith Podcast and amongst the online left. You don't know how we would survive without you. No, I, we have to get a deal done. And Michael, is that enough? Is that going to be enough to sort of unite the factions inside her party? Probably not, because the, she's backing President Biden's approach to the war in Gaza, which has been the subject of this controversy and of this criticism, particularly among those Arab Americans, progressives, folks like we've seen the uncommitted vote in Michigan. So Vice President Harris standing by President Biden, not showing any parity in terms of their stance and how they would approach the war, probably not going to help with that criticism. But I think that the main question here is that the, the, the Paris campaign is betting that this block of uncommitted voters, the progressive voters, are going to, at the end of the day, vote Democratic and side with Vice President Kamala Harris because the alternative, former President Trump, in their eyes, is worse for the situation in Gaza. Now, will if, you know they're they're rolling the dice and betting that they will sh they will show up because they think that the alternative is worse. That's sort of what we saw with the DNC last month, where a Palestinian American did not speak at the convention that came under very sharp uh, criticism from progressives. But again, Democrats plowed ahead and did not give them a speaking slot, likely because they figure that at the end of the day, they will show up despite this divide. It's a very large bet to make, uh, especially among this very dedicated, uncommitted vote group and in a key swing state of Michigan. But this just seems to be how the campaign is playing this issue about two months out from Election Day. Reese, what is your reaction to the campaign's message here? So the campaign is basically, I mean, to Michael's point, they are kind of making a bet here. The fact that these voters are going to come back to them at the end of the day. Um, but that, that's, that's a big bet to make. These, the, these voters are extremely angry. You saw their protests outside the DNC um, in Chicago. And so th they're very upset. They're angry. And I think it is kind of a bet to make and it's risky to take on because it's, if these people don't show up for you and don't show out and don't vote for you, that's a voter block that you're losing. And in this tight election, 
those smallest of margins really can make a difference, especially in key pivotal states such as Michigan. And I think it's a big risk that they're taking. Absolutely. Like you said, all about Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Can't afford to lose any votes there. Not at all. Michael Schnell, Reese Gorman, thank you so much for joining us. So good on Michael Schnell and the other guy for actually ringing an alarm bell to a certain degree. There's another clip I'm going to play next that shows the opposite, more of the manufacturing consent. But I've been trying to get to the bottom of why this really, this line of reasoning really bothers me, uh, combined with AOC's, you know, Trump is going to be worse line of reasoning. And I think it's because it presumes that saying, articulating that you are unwilling to vote for Kamala Harris unless she commits to a weapons embargo against Israel, it it presumes that she's not going to move at the same time that she people are making the argument that she's better than Biden, right? Because there is a world, there is a universe where voters protest, where uncommitted does its thing, where people say, hey, I'm willing to withhold my vote for you, vote for the Green Party, vote for other options or stay at home. But I will deliver this vote to you if we see a real substantive commitment to a shift in policy. You are, in fact, the vice president right now. But when people say things like they're making this bet, they're gambling on people coming back to her anyway, it's basically telling the audience, oh, she's not going anywhere. So to the extent that you are displeased with that, go ahead and register green, baby, (laughs) because that's the way it's going to be. I think this is the one time I will say this. Well, at least they're being honest. <laughs> she's not that she's not going to move on that. Uh, I think this is where we have to talk about uh, movements and organizing and activism. So, as an organizer, I think it's important that at some point you have to hold the line. The question mm-hmm. is, when does that come about? I look back at 2016 and I think, what if we all would have, everyone would have held the line, like for Bernie, and didn't go over to support Hillary? Hillary lost anyway. So what would have happened if we all held the line and maybe moved over and and built up a third party movement, right? Now we're faced with the decision of genocide. If there is ever a time for you to hold the line, now is that time. That doesn't mean go vote for Donald Trump. Don't go support him either. But I would think that if, if at any moment you need to hold the line, it is at this particular moment. I feel that if you vote for Kamala Harris, you are going to be rewarding genocide. You are rewarding the Biden administration for genocide. If you let them run away with this, there's no telling what they're going to do. And to that talking point that was in that video, if they feel like you're always going to come back regardless, why would they do anything for you? Why why would they give you universal health care? Why would they give you free public universities? Why would they do this? Why would they bring back the child tax credit? Why why would they do those things if they know that in the end, you're still going to support the party? This idea that it's going to be worse because you could get Donald Trump. There's always going to be a Donald Trump just under a different name. I had heard people prior to Trump's election make the same type of rhetoric that Donald Trump made. A lot of people don't realize, but I lived in the South for quite a long time. So Mm -hmm. I was used to hearing that type of rhetoric. Doesn't make it right. But it wasn't a surprise to me, the things that I heard Donald Trump say. He said those things out loud, whereas some of these other politicians say them behind closed doors. But that being said, you cannot reward genocide. And I think Lawrence O'Donnell said this best. The way that you get the Democratic Party to change is that you have to stop supporting it. If you want to pull the party, the major party that is closest to the way your thinking, to what you're thinking. You must, you must show them that you're capable of not voting for them. If you don't show them you're capable of not voting for them, they don't have to listen to you. I promise you that. I worked within the Democratic Party. I didn't listen or have to listen to anything on the left. In, while I was working in the Democratic Party because the left had nowhere to go. Supporting them and helping them win, that's not going to make them want to move the needle for you. And then we have to have a significant conversation in this country about having free financing of public elections. We have to have a serious conversation about removing these lobby interest groups from electoral politics. APAC shouldn't be there. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield should not be there. This is part of the reason why these politicians are not moving in a way that actually helps and benefits the American people. 
You see them giving $3.8 billion a year to Israel. You see all the money that's went out the door to Ukraine. But we have so many homeless people. The homeless population increased 25% under Biden's administration. We can't feed our own and take care of our own, but we're sending money elsewhere. In Israel, everybody has health care. In Israel, everybody has a free public college. But when we talk about having those things here, it's frowned upon. And it's frowned upon by the politicians because their donors frown upon it. So how dare we want those rights for people here in this country, but we're giving money to another country for them to have those rights there. So I think we need to have some serious conversations here about having free public elections in this country and removing big money interest. Yeah, I do think that one of the more sort of pernicious, like bad faith aspects of AOC's screed against Jill Stein was accusing her of uh, running every four years, not being on the ballot, uh, not doing um, things in the in, in the interim, um, you know, seeking fame, you know, not doing organizing. Y'all, this is a little spicy, but I have thoughts. I feel like I should save this for a live. I'm not coming for people who are thinking about this. You, I'll talk to you. What I have a problem with is the fact that If you are running for president, you are the de facto leader of your party. And first of all, trust me on this. I run as a third party candidate in New York. I'm also run as a working families party candidate in addition to running as a Democrat. Because trust me, I've been on record that about my criticisms of a two party system. So this is not about that. But you are the leader of your party. And if you run for years and years and years and years and years in a row and your party has not grown, and you don't add city council seats and you don't add down ballot candidates and and you don't add state electeds, that's bad leadership. And that to me is what's upsetting because if you have been your party's nominee for 12 years in a row, four years ago and four years before that and four years before that, and you cannot grow your movement pretty much at all and can't pursue any successful strategy and all you do is show up once every four years to speak to people who are justifiably pissed off but you're just showing up once every four years to do that you're not serious you're not off to me it does not read as authentic it reads as predatory i'm sorry i'm just saying it because as a person i endorse working families party candidates. I endorse DSA candidates. I take risks and I endorse even in primaries against Democrats when it's merited. What does this person do to grow power? For the- When so much of what the Green Party has to do is fight against the Democratic Party, AOC's party, which she has chosen to be deeply faithful to, um, working and spending millions of dollars trying to kick Green Party candidates off the ballot and deny them democracy, which is an ongoing effort that they're doing right now at the same time that AOC has the time and energy to hop on Instagram Live and punch down. Um, And to pretend as though this is a fair fight and to have proximity to So many local New York Green Party members. I mean, if I recall correctly, people like Jumaane Williams were door knocking and rallying people to get out for AOC back in 2018. And to paint with such a broad brush and to do so so inaccurately when, of course, Jill Stein was not planning to run this year. She had to run this year when uh, um, Cornell West regrettably chose to leave the Green Party and left the ballot blank. And we all know that the Green Party, as Jill Stein said in her, I think, very compelling rebuttal, has to be on the ballot or it loses all of the work that they've done in previous years and their ballot lines for the next four years from now. To lobby those kinds of charges, ignorant apparently of the fact that she didn't even run in 2020 and it was uh, Howie Hawkins, like all of these things together. I mean, I, I... I had already, I think for me, the point at which 
I was no longer even going to engage in like a kind of cursory level of like good faith civility with AOC was the DNC lie. But this really was the nail in the coffin for my willingness, at least to say, I don't think anybody should go out of their way to even sort of rhetorically gesture at respect for her because she has shown such disrespect to adversarial left movements in the United States of America. This is true. Um, I think we need to ask the question, who is AOC really? Because it turns out she's not really who she told us she was. This goes back to when she first announced that she was running. I, I spoke to Zineb Day about this on call-in, back when we all used to still do call-in, about what happened there with Justice Democrats and AOC. And I, to my understanding, Zineb worked in communications uh, for those candidates. So she met a lot of them and helped them. And one of the things that I'll always remember that she said to me is that AOC specifically told her to leave that she was a bar t bartender in her bio because that sounds better. You know, not including that she had owned a startup, not including that the truth about where she really grew up, did not growing up in the Bronx, growing up in Westchester, which that is a big difference uh, when you look at the education system in Westchester versus in the Bronx, very big difference. Uh, not including that, you know, yes, let's tell the story about the mother uh, cleaning homes, but let's leave out the fact of the father being a president of that architecture company that he worked at. So this whole story that was sold to people about being this in a lower income girl who grew up in the Bronx, this has been planned from the beginning. Now, maybe I think she did want to, you know, fight back. She did stage like the protests inside Nancy Pelosi's office. I think we were all applauding that. Like, yeah, she's pushing back against the establishment and Nancy Pelosi of all people, one of the higher I was higher there, ups. it feels like a million <laughs> years ago, but I, I was there with, reporting on it with The Intercept, yeah. Right, one of the higher ups. I showed the video last night when she sat down with you in 2019 at SXSB, I forget the name of that conference. And I said, when's the last time South you saw Southwest, AOC? Yeah. yeah. When's the last time you saw AOC sit down and have a conversation with Brie? When's the last time you saw her on independent media? When is the last time? So something happened there where obviously Cynthia McKinney brought this to my attention years ago, that once she was elected, there was a conversation behind closed doors that, listen, uh, this is how this is going to work. You are not going to go against us. You're going to follow dim leadership. Otherwise, we will make sure that you no longer have a seat. That's why Cynthia McKinney is no longer there. So it is very clear that conversation has also happened with members of the squad as well. Ilhan Omar, I think, tends to push back a little bit more than some of the others have done. Uh, same thing with Cori Bush was pushing back more on policing because her community was directly impacted. We we're talking about Ferguson and the BLM protests. That's where she came from. And you see Cori Bush is gone. And you see Jamal Bowman is gone. So I think that for AOC, she decided to take the easier path, which is to go along with them establishment and have a career in politics. Whatever, do you. But at the end of the day, don't point your finger at a politician that is running on a left platform that you would applaud because Kamala Harris isn't polling as well as you guys wanted her to poll. Nobody voted for Kamala Harris in the Democrat 2024 primary, agree? Nobody voted for her. And not to mention yeah. there were I mean, other candidates. Literally nobody. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, go ahead. There were there were other candidates that were running in the Democrat primary. Not my choice, but they were running and they didn't get this type of attention. In fact, they were smeared. How dare you challenge Joe Biden? He's the incumbent and he's the one that's going to be the nominee and that's it. And Kamala Harris is just installed. Yes, she's the vice president, but Joe Biden didn't resign. Joe Biden is still in office. So they just picked her. She was handpicked. And for all the people that I see who have complained about the Democratic Party, the way that they treated Bernie Sanders uh, twice, for all the people that I see complain about these corporate candidates and how you cannot support them at the end of the day, it was interesting to me, not just corporate media, but even independent media, the number of people that just got on board and said, yay, Kamala, all of a sudden these things don't matter. All of a sudden supporting a candidate that takes corporate money doesn't matter. All of a sudden the candidate being selected doesn't matter. What has happened here? 
Do you think this is just mainly because of Donald Trump? I, I don't. Like I said, there's always going to be a Donald Trump. But it's very clear to me that there is a clear incentive, especially I'm sure you know this on YouTube. There's a clear incentive to be a part of the duopoly. So if you are pushing the Democrat candidate, there's an incentive for that. If you're pushing the Republican candidate, there's a big incentive for that as well. And I don't know if people are just choosing to go along with that or people just gave up. But at some point, you have to hold the line. I, I honestly, I mean, I don't want to belabor the point because I've been, you know, fetching about this on the podcast for like the last four episodes. But I'm honestly like shocked to my core by who I've seen in our media environment completely flip. Um, people who I, I genuinely like and have respect for the work that they do. So I'm like really trying very hard <laughs> to keep individual names out of it. But I think, you know, the group that I'm alluding to, I mean, there are people, there are people who fully endorse Jill Stein who are now talking about Kamala, like being better than Biden and improving agendas and all she has to do is signal in this way and that way. And it's, and I, to, to, I think you made a really important point, which is that we prided ourselves as leftists that kind of in the Bernie sphere of understanding to judge candidates on the basis of the money they take and the people they are beholden to. And to look at Kamala Harris with her multi-millions from APAC and a bunch of other big Zionist donors and not have any skepticism of this. The same way that there are these people on the right now, of course, who are looking at Tulsi Gabbard hugged up with Rabbi Shmuley and RFK Jr. obviously ha hugged up with Rabbi Shmuley and making the case that, Bi that Trump is going to be good on this issue are also crazy. But I don't have expectations of them. I have high higher expectations of my friends on the left who purported to know better. Um, and I don't really understand it. Speaking, however, of Bernie Sanders, did you happen to catch uh, his interview with Hasan Minaj this week? I did. Oh, you did? Let's play a quick clip and then I want to get your, your response. I have so many friends that were Bernie or bust. And when you didn't win in 2016 or 2020, they bust. They checked out of politics and then they hard pivoted into Bitcoin. Really? Then they pivoted into ketamine and Zen. Let's see where that goes. But they are despondent. What do you say to my friends who now feel like you may be falling in line a little bit too much with the corporate democratic establishment? At this particular moment in history and perhaps in any moment in history, Despair is not an option to say, well, I supported Bernie. He didn't win. I'm going into Bitcoin. Sorry, not good enough. <laughs> That's you... going to be your most controversial statement of this whole interview. All right. So I think if you are a human being who wants to live in a sane and decent society, who is concerned about your kids, you know what? Sorry, you don't have a right to check out. That's a privilege you don't have. I lost. I was there. I'm not dropping out. You got to look at the world as it is and do the best you can. And people can disagree. Hassan, what is the best? How do we go forward? But dropping out is certainly not one of the options. All right. So LOL at Bernie not really getting the joke. But, you know, at the end, Hassan gets in a substantive question, right? One the likes of which I don't think I've ever seen Bernie ask, uh, ask because he doesn't sit down uh, with leftists anymore, much like AOC. But, you know, what do you say to people who feel like you've sold out, that you've gone to corporate? Bernie sort of sidesteps the question and, and pivots Pivots it, pivot, sorry, pivots it, it <laughs> pivots it to this thing that we hear folks say all the time, which is uh, the straw man of, well, you can't be a non-participant. You can't sit this out. What do you make of that? I think that's an excuse for Bernie Sanders because the reality is votes have to be earned. No one owes you their vote. And Bernie Sanders in particular, there are a number of places that I would go into with caution if I were to approach people again and ask them, could you donate to a politician? Even when it comes to third party, I am very hesitant because a number of those people donated what they had left to Bernie Sanders, poor people, lower income people, because they believed that he was going to fight for them. Theo Vaughn was, uh, or Bernie was just recently on Theo Vaughn's show and mm -hmm. he admitted, yeah, the Democrats cheated me in 2016. And, mm -hmm. you know, now he's on this show and he's saying something. So I think it's just, it's it's very clear that a lot of these politicians have been captured. Bernie is one of them. Um, I really thought we had a chance. I mean, I know you saw yourself, you were as press secretary, the numbers that I saw on the ground, I'm not talking about online, but just on the ground. Bernie came here. I went to one of his rallies in Boston 
there were over 10,000 people. Joe Biden showed up. I think there's like 150 people. Like it's the numbers on the ground, the energy. I met people at Bernie rallies that were independent, registered independents, people that were non-voters that just checked out completely. And they said, nope, this is what we need. I'm gonna give this a chance. I met some people at Bernie rallies that were conservatives, but they supported the universal health care. And they were like, yeah, we could do this. We got to do something here. So he was able to bring all different types of people together. And I think there is this, this idea that it was mainly just, it's just Democrats that were supporting Bernie. That's actually not true. He did pretty well with independent voters. He did the best with independent voters, better than any other person in the, in the race. Yeah. Really could have had something strong there. And then I, I remember I interviewed Jesse Ventura and he just kind of woke me up a little bit. He explained to me that he approached Bernie Sanders when Bernie announced he was running in 2016. And he said, Bernie, if you lose to Hillary Clinton, will you be willing to work with me and starting a third party? And Mm. he said, Bernie told him, absolutely not. I will be supporting Hillary Clinton. Now, had I known that uh, at the time, I wouldn't have donated money to Bernie. So th- that was always the plan. That That's what Jesse Ventura woke me up to. That was always the plan for him to, in the end, support the Democrat, you know, corporate candidate. Now, now Jesse Ventura is also endorsing Kamala and saying, because we need a woman after he endorsed RFK, it's all over the place. But I just think that people seem to be so desperate for a hero. And I don't yeah. think the heroism is going to come from a politician. I just had this conversation with Jamal Green, uh, incredibly mm-hmm. 27 years old, ran for mayor of Chicago, young activists, uh, fought back against Chase Bank and won. Uh, These are the type of people that I'm trying to bring on, people who are making a change within the community, people who are organizing and realizing like, listen, we have to get the work done on the ground. And we were just talking about this, just had this conversation and he said, these politicians are not gonna save you. You have to work within your community and help each other. One of the ways that I do that And the rest of us at RBN is like, we do mutual aid. So I just had a back to school event that we just did where we were giving out school supplies to family members here. These are things that people really need. That's one piece of it. So there's the organizing, there's mutual aid, and there is still electoralism because you have to pass legislation. I would like to get people to push more on the local level for electoralism. When November comes, if you don't wanna vote for the president and you live in a ballot initiative state, you should be out there to vote for those ballot measures because it will affect you directly. I mean, I know in a number of states, we're talking about what women's right to choose is gonna be on the ballot, particularly Florida comes to mind immediately. We're talking about minimum wage. We're talking about, uh, I think recreational marijuana might be another one that's coming up. We're talking about school uh, credits. So a lot of people just don't think about those things. They just think that just voting for the president is the way to go. And that's how you're going to say the president is not going to save you, uh, especially as long as we are attached to the military industrial complex. We're attached to corporate money interest. We're attached to Wall Street. Look, Barack Obama stood right there in front of you during the 08 housing crisis. And instead of helping people keep their homes after they fell you know, upon those predatory lenders, He chose to bail out Wall Street. So all these people in this Clinton, Obama circle, they're all in that circle for a reason. So you cannot look to them to be your hero. We have to help each other. And then I encourage people to really get involved in local politics, run for city council, run for mayor, run for governor, and see how you can impact change on the local level. Yeah, to that point, I think I said uh, Jamani Williams earlier when I was talking about local Greens who came out for AOC in 2018. I actually meant Jabari Brisport. Uh, I keep doing that with him. I don't know why. I love Jabari. He was on the first episode of this podcast, if I recall correctly. And he is currently um, running for New York City Council, a Green Party candidate. So again, I, I totally echo and repeat your point. There are, to Jill Stein's point, local Green Party people running for election constantly, they have a larger uphill battle than Democrats like AOC doing the same, even though they get the help of independent people, the DSA door knocking for them, Green Party members door knocking for her back in 2018. But then to turn around and act as though you got there all on your own and then pull the ladder up behind you and levy 
actual attacks at the people who are trying to do what you are unwilling to do within the Democratic Party was just deeply, deeply low and disappointing uh, to me. I did promise to come back to this clip about manufacturing uh, consent um, for uh, for Kamala Harris. You mentioned earlier uh, that she didn't win any um, actual votes, that she had to drop out before California because she was pulling behind um, uh, Andrew Yang. All of this is well-trodden territory. We know that this is true. But as you were talking, I was thinking about the energy and excitement around her when she first announced in, in 2020 or 2019, so much so that I remember being a little bit nervous because the narrative was, here's this person who also believes in Medicare for all, who's this person who's legitimately progressive and she's black and she's Indian and she's a woman and she's young. So why wouldn't you choose her over Bernie? A narrative that ended up getting picked up by the media to defend Elizabeth Warren a little later on once Kamala's kind of energy had burned off. But I, I'm seeing now parallels that I didn't necessarily appreciate at the time, frankly, with AOC and the idea that she came up it's confusing to me now because at the time, she had this critique of weaponized identity politics that was so refreshing and echoed a lot of what I was writing about at the time. But the way that she's been used by the Democratic Party or who she's become as she's been enfolded into the Democratic Party very much seems like in the line of Kamala Harris and Barack Obama and the strategy of Democrats simply wrapping their corporate politics up in a more appealing fresher, younger, more diverse package. And I, I'm not one to try to do the mind reading of saying, well, I think AOC had this like nefarious plot from the beginning. I think it's much more likely that she got inside and was influenced the way that so many people are influenced and who might genuinely think that she's doing the best thing she can do by quote unquote working with inside the party. But in terms of the motives and interests of the Democratic Party, it's very difficult not to see her being set up in the way that Kamala Harris was set up for exactly the way she's being used now. She just was a newly elected senator in what, 2017. She immediately starts getting articles written about her, about how she's the next Black hope, the next great Black hope, and how she's going to be the next Obama. She is chosen as VP for the oldest president ever, when everyone's thinking to the possibility of, of him being a one-term president, even if he backed away from that and then at the end and then obviously ended up dropping out. And it does seem almost like a disturbing pattern, I should say, that we're seeing identity being weaponized in this way. Even after, I think, we went through a period of time where I think everybody sort of woke up to the superficiality of believing a candidate was going to be progressive simply because they were from a historically marginalized group. Um, I, I, that was a lot. So I want to get let you get in here before I play this clip. I think there was still, even within the marginalized group, there was still a class divide. And that's, that's part of it too. I mean, you look at someone like AOC, she did go to Boston University. Not a, I worked at BU. It's not an easy school to get into. Uh, there's that as well. But it's true. They do handpick people. I remember seeing the, the discussion between Cory Booker at an APAC meeting, and he was telling them how to recruit Black people to support and be a part of APAC. And he said, you have to go get them in the colleges. You have to get them while they're in college. So some of these people have been recruited early on. There was that video that we saw with a flashback of Vivek Ramaswamy and Pete Buttigieg at the same event where Al Sharpton was speaking at Harvard University. <laughs> so they, it's, it, they're, they're picking some of these people early on. And I think Kamala Harris was also one of those people that the Clintons were looking at they considered her to be, oh, she's next. We got to bring her in. Tulsi Gabbard was once a part of that group. I don't know if you remember, but she was supposed to be the next DNC darling. But then she kind of got herself uh, removed from that Democratic group because she endorsed Bernie Sanders in 2016 instead of endorsing Hillary Clinton. They were done with her after that. So they do have their, their handpicked people that they say, this is going to be the next face. This is the one we're going to go with. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. Although I will say, I, I think that that Harvard event was like a uh, a Kennedy School um, IOP like uh, event, like a speakers event. And I will say that every like, those are everybody goes to those. I remember I went to see the only time I went over to the Kennedy School. I think I was was it was I in summer school or was I just an, a freshman? 
what what year was it? 2004. I think it was 2004. I was a freshman or it was a summer after my freshman year when the DNC convention speech happened where Obama spoke and got on everybody's radar. And I think my boyfriend at the time who didn't uh, go to Harvard, he was a recent graduate actually, but he was there for like a performing arts program in the area, really wanted to go. So we went. I don't know that I knew who Obama was at the time, um, but it was packed. And I think back to that now as a kind of historical event and who else was in the audience and were the Pete Buttigieg's of the world around. And it is it is a weird it is a weird little vortex where there is this presumption that this is the winning team. It feels very Avengers. And there's, there is definitely a feeling like I'm in, an, I'm in an environment where I could have this much power and influence. You think of it as a good thing, like positive influence on the world. But there's a, I think there is definitely a weird sort of um, I want to say mind game, but like there is a, a kind of um, pernicious thirst that exists in those environments that some people channel toward good and then you end up you know, one other thing I want to say about AOC is I don't think like in the grand scheme of Congress members, like I do think that she is dramatically lower income because they're all millionaires. Right. So the fact that she even came from a middle class, upper middle class family, if you wanted to call it that, although I'm not sure that you could, but doesn't doesn't to me diminish what she could have been even having the experience of having to, let's say, take out loans to go to school or having to work during school is far removed from the experience of the average Congress member or someone like Joe Crowley. But again, to parallel this thing with with um, uh, with the Kamala Harris, I remember when I was covering her race with Crowley, there was this little bit of uh, inconvenient fact that Crowley in the grand scheme of Democrats was one of the more progressive ones. And people who were defending him at the time were like, well, why is she challenging him as opposed to someone who was like genuinely more of a Richie Torres type. Of course, he wasn't in Congress at the time, but you get my drift. There was a similar argument that was made when uh, Ayanna Presley won. Um, what was that guy's name? Cup Cuperno, an Italian name. I forget the name of the guy that she beat. But again, one of the more progressive members of Congress. So why are you challenging him? Kamala Harris's first DA race that she won, she beat out this genuinely progressive prosecutor in San Francisco, Tom Hanelin. Um, and that all got blur blurred away because of identity politics. And I do wonder, like, in retrospect, if that should have been a little bit of a red flag to begin with. Is the Democratic Party more, find it, do they find it more acceptable to have that kind of an insurgent challenge within their own party if it's just replacing one relatively progressive person with another relatively progressive person in a way that fundamentally is not changing the balance of progressivism in Congress? I think a lot of it, too, also has to deal with their district. At that point in time, there was a lot of focus on AOC out of all the squad members or soon to be squad members that were running because she had the best chance to win because of the demographics of her district. So even if mm -hmm. you watch that documentary, Knocking Down the House, there's a lot of focus more so on her because she had the best chance to win because of the demographics of the, the constituency. So there was that. Uh, when it comes to Kamala Harris, the gentleman that she ran against, she actually ran to the right of him on crime right, and cri cri criminal justice. Uh, so there was that. Very much so. Similar thing with Ayanna Presley. I lived in her district when she first won. She won the first time. Same thing with the demographics. She had a better chance of winning because of the demographics in the district. So I think that's a big part of it. And also with AOC and Ayanna Presley, at that point in time, we have to remember who was president. Donald Trump was. So- it was a perfect, I think, storm to push them through. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've been teasing this clip forever. Let's play it. It's uh, Anand Jirahadadas making the case that Kamala actually is um, a progressive improvement over Joe Biden. Let's take a listen. Going at some of the issues on which she has held different positions. Last hour, we talked uh, in some detail about fracking. She's saying very clearly, no, I am not going to ban fracking. I said that as the vice presidential nominee in 2020. I'm saying it now as the Democratic nominee for president. We're not going to ban fracking, despite what I said in 2019 during my own primary campaign. Now talking about immigration, that she does not want to decriminalize, decriminalize illegal immigration. Um, so... What did you make of that as a voter, an independent voter who is sitting there saying, 
which version of Vice President Harris should I believe? The one in front of me now or the one who was in the Senate and the one who ran for president in 2019? What she's saying effectively is believe what I'm saying now. Did she make a convincing case? Yeah, I think she did. And, and I think sometimes we're not honest with ourselves about, you know, a couple of things. First of all, we change our minds uh, all the time based on information, based on where we're sitting, based on whether we're a junior person at the office or the person running the office. Um, and it's actually normal. Uh, we should normalize changing your mind. I think sometimes we in journalism um, shame people kind of figuring out a different view that they might hold and call it flip flopping and try to kind of catch people in it when in in, in some ways on some issues, that's a measure of, of progress. I think we also need to recognize that she is in a different context right now than she was in a 2020 Democratic primary. She's in a general election against an American fascist, Donald Trump. And, you know, let's let's just be real. Like you need to sometimes do different things in a general election against a far right candidate than you do in a primary. Like, I, I, I don't think we can kind of pretend that's not the case. I think she said something by way of explanation of that, that actually was quite interesting and moving and goes beyond the familiar kind of tacking to the center. She talked about this notion of consensus when she was kind of pressed on this idea of reversal. And she said, I believe we have to work toward a consensus of how we can solve these things. And I think that kind of allows you to square the circle, which is to say, and this is true for a lot of liberals, uh, you know, in American life, where I think a lot of liberals who would distinguish themselves from progressives uh, actually share progressive ideals in a certain form, share a certain notion of what immigration should be like. Don't don't think the way the right does about it. Share certain notions about, you know, preferring people to have health care to not having health care. Where liberals and progressives often differ is like their sense of how much power they're willing to smash to do it, where they think other people are. And so she talked about, look, I have had I've expressed some of these ideals, but we have to be mindful, particularly in the position she's in now of where other people are, where the country is. What can a large majority of people be led to want and be led to fight for? Uh, and I think that's a reasonable position to take, even if it's not you know, the same as my position on any given issue. Ugh, savvy. <laughs> OK. Kamala Harris is flip-flopping, but it's okay because uh, her values are the same. She's a, she's a practical woman who is trying to find consensus. Is it the consensus view that we should keep sending bombs to Israel to drop on innocent Palestinians? No, not at all. And I, I think that, again, this is what he's he's paid to do. He's paid to defend the Democratic Party, regardless of who the candidate is going to be, especially the selected candidate. So this is what, that's him doing his job. That's what he's paid to do. But just let's flip it around. Imagine if it was a Republican that was in that position. How would they speak about them if they, are they allowed to change their mind? No, like this is just, it's ridiculous. Kamala Harris is running in an empty suit. And what they want you to do is just, vote for her because she's not Donald Trump. I've checked her website multiple times. There is still no policy platform on Kamala Harris's website. She's literally an empty suit. And then there are things that are happening, which I mentioned to you before, in her own state, which she's very silent about. Has Kamala Harris said anything about the reparations bill that the Democratic Party just blocked in California? That's her home state. Gavin Newsom blocked it because he didn't want to have to sign it. But Kamala Harris wants you to know that if you're Black, you should be supporting her. She has no Black agenda. She has no policy platform. Like, I don't understand this at all. So people think they're getting something, but what are you getting that you didn't already have? The housing, the housing, uh, the, the $150,000 or $25,000 for the housing that she talked about, I'm going to mm -hmm. give people $25,000, first time home buyer, first generation home buyers. Then we come to find out later on, she's talking about a $25,000 tax credit. That's not the same thing. Like you're uh, misleading exactly. people. Exactly. It's exactly what she did, by the way, with uh, Medicare for all back in the day in her student debt policy, which I swear to God was like uh, hula hoop for 15 minutes while hopping on one foot, eat a raspberry cheesecake and then say the alphabet backward and we'll give you student debt collection. It was the most Byzantine, insane thing, but she keeps getting away with it. Announcing a policy that sounds straightforward, populist, and Bernie-ish, 
and then walking it back and relying on people having sufficient confusion and giving sufficient cover to media pundits who could pretend like she genuinely is a, is a progressive to pull the wool over people's eyes for a period of time. The question is, is she going to be able to keep the front up for long enough this time to win an election, whereas in previous instances, it crumbled after a few months? Here's my prediction. Yeah. Let's say she wins. I think that if she wins, I think there's going to be a lot of excitement in the beginning. People are like, yay, we got the first woman president and she's a woman of color. But I think as you go into her presidency, because Kamala Harris to me just does not seem like she's ready for this, right? I think there's going to be a number of issues that come up. We have the war with Russia and Ukraine. We have the genocide in Gaza. These are things that are already happening that she is going to have to deal with under her presidency. So there's that. I have a feeling that the economic issues are still going to be a problem. And I have a prediction that if she does win, she will be a one-term president because her presidency will be so horrible. I also think that she's probably going to fall back a little bit, take less uh, or spend less time in front of the camera, do less interviews, kind of how Joe Biden did, kind of hide herself a little bit, maybe put Tim Waltz out there to take some of these, these tough questions. Mm. But I just have this feeling. And you know what's sad about it? If that prediction holds true, people are going to point back to her and say, see, this is why we can't have a female president. We tried that before. And black, she's going to take everybody down with her. Um, and that is that is really regrettable. Sabi, I'm sorry we didn't get uh, into the reparation stuff. I intended to have more time for that. And then I got curated with some of these clips. But I hope you will come back um, and unpack that for us. For those who want to see what you've already said about it on your show, tell the listeners where they can find more of you on the internet and beyond. Yeah, you can sign me on uh, YouTube. My channel is Sabi Sabs. You can also find me over at Revolutionary Blackout Network. I do a show over there with my comrade JB. We usually do a lot of interviews. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Sabby Sabs number two. That's it. Terrific. I strongly recommend it. I think Sabby runs one of the best streams in the business. I'm very envious of people who can manage to regularly live stream. If you haven't already gone to her channel and subscribed and followed, I strongly suggest that you do. Thank you for listening. If you want an additional episode of Bad Faith Podcast every week, you know you can go to patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast and get our Monday's episode. This past Monday was an almost three-hour episode with Vincent Be Bevins. Some people are saying it's the favorite one yet. I don't know. It's what people are saying. You can check it out yourself at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. As always, take care of yourselves and keep the faith. Hey YouTube, thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.